At 8.37, we welcome in Senator Shelley Moore Capito via telephone. Senator, good morning. Great to have you here. Good morning. Good morning. It's a nice day. We're here on, uh, uh, what am I on? Uh, 79 South at the uh, rest area. Oh, I'm, well, I'm <laughs> on my way to Beckley, on my way to Beckley in Bluefield. I'm, I'm glad you're stopped. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. This, it's a little spotty here. It is. It can be. And, and I-79 is a fun highway anyway. It's like I-81 where you drive and it goes ka-chunk, 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 <laughs> That's ka-chunk. true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, questions for you. First and foremost, I, I saw Vladimir Putin's in the news this morning in regards to you. Ukraine saying that uh, the United States and the Ukraine started this war, which is just, I mean, I know they tell a lot of lies there, but it's kind of mind blowing that you'd have the the intestinal fortitude to just blow that line out there. Well, I mean, I think what he's doing, he's talking to his own people. He's lost the estimates of the uh, of the Russian soldiers that have been lost. And then the recruiting that he's having to do is uh is very sad i think for that country and and we know who the aggressor is he he obviously lobbed those uh brought all those tanks into the the eastern part of ukraine and and thought he would have it over in three to four days but he underestimated the will of the ukrainian people for freedom and we're going to support that as long with nato so that's what he's i think he's really talking to his own people because i don't think the international community is buying what he's selling I want to ask you also about East Palestine, Ohio, because that's not all that far from the West Virginia border. Are West Virginia citizens in that area in danger, or have they been in danger or exposed? You know, I think the biggest uh, potential uh, areas of concern for people in West Virginia from the East Palestine thing is the water. Uh, the water, uh, obviously, the, the watersheds flow into the Ohio And if they're leaching those chemicals, which they obviously were, uh, they had a big plume coming down the Ohio River, which impacted the Wheeling, Parkersburg, Huntington outtakes of of water. And there were uh, great precautions. That plume of chemicals has moved all the way through, and the water's clear now. But I think the biggest problem is in that region, and it could impact West Virginians, of residual chemicals still in the watershed and, and for years to, I mean, possibly years to come. And I've been disappointed with the response that we've seen. Uh, I just feel like in situations like this, it's not good to think you've corrected things. You have to overcorrect and talk and be transparent. And I think that's been really missing. And you see that people's uh, concerns, and I don't blame them. You and Senator Tom Carper are working together with right. the, uh, Senate, the Environment and uh, Public Works Committee uh, in regards to this. Can you tell me if that's gotten underway already, or and if sure. not, when? Yeah, we're going to have a hearing. Uh, we do have jurisdiction over clean air and clean water. We have uh, numerous hearings throughout the year, but I was especially uh, pushing for this. I, I feel like we need to uh, bring up the health officials, the environmental officials, uh, a resident or somebody from the community to come and, and talk about what's happened and uh, where uh, where the you know laws can be either refined or where the oversight hasn't been what it needs to be. We're going to be doing this early March. Uh, I thought it probably best to give those officials another week or so to because they're right on ground right now, and you don't want to interrupt an investigation or also a, a remediation. So uh, it will probably be the first week or so of March that we will have them in front of our committee. We're working on who we're going to have right now. When I used to talk to Steve Allen, he now does the same job in Jefferson County that he used to do here in Berkeley County for Homeland Security and Emergency Management. He would mm-hmm. mention to me that and we have a lot of train tracks around here. When these dangerous hazardous chemicals roll through your town, you're supposed to be notified of what's on board so that if there is an issue, you are equipped to take care of it. I understand that didn't take place in that situation there. You know, I think we're going to find those things out. Uh, This will sound very bureaucratic to everybody listening and to you, but the train safety issues are over on the Commerce Committee, which I'm also on that. I'm sure there will be a hearing there. There's a question as to the length of the train, what the cars were carrying, what kind of condition they were in. Uh, it was also a, a braking system. Uh, they began to brake because they knew something was going wrong, but it was too late. You could see the video. I don't know if you've seen it of the thing sparking as it's going through the town. Mm-hmm. So there was an issue, you know, previous or you know, within the several minutes before this happened. 
Uh, and then I do think the notification issues are something that we need to know. I don't have the answer to that, whether they were notified or whether it's a blanket notification. The, these chemicals are going to be going through these train tracks, you know, three times a day, and these are the approximate times. I, that I don't know, but I think that's absolutely a valid question to be asked. I did not realize at the time, but houses are right up against a lot of those train tracks there. So we're really lucky that nobody was um, injured in this uh, in terms of physical injuries uh, at the site at the time of the accident. But this has been a really poor, disappointing. I don't think the administration's been on top of it as much as they should be. I think the governor of Ohio has tried to manage it, but you see even he has mixed messages at times. The CDC, who's supposed to tell you if your water's safe, if you have a chemical in it, has been absent. And and so those are, I think, big questions that need to be asked. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Senator. Uh, I, hey. was a, I was a firefighter and hazmat guy for many, many, many years. And these derailments happen all the time. Um, right. And the magnitude of this derailment, quite honestly, is, I mean, it's bad. Certainly, if you live there, it's really bad. But in the grand scheme of things, it's it's not that out of proportion to what we see a couple of times a year throughout throughout the country. So why is there such a focus, do you think, on the East Palestine or Palestine? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Yeah. Uh, uh, derailment as opposed to some of the others. It's just a tipping point. You know, I think part of it is and I, I do think you bring up a good point that there are just derailments. Uh, fairly regularly. We had one down in the Kanawha Valley in, in Cabin Creek several years ago, also carrying uh, some hazardous materials. I think, first of all, it's the materials that are being carried uh, obviously brings to light. I, I think also, remember, they had the controlled burn. Do you remember that right after? Mm-hmm. With the chemicals I, I do. I would not want to be the guy with the flare. I would not either. And, and I think that's a cause of concern because you see those pictures with the black smoke. Everybody knows that can't be good for you. And uh, I think just the mixed messages that the leadership of both NS and at the governmental levels has been giving makes people wonder. And if you just tell people, you know, here's the precaution, clear out for two, two weeks, we'll pay for you to clear out for two weeks, we'll monitor your water, we'll make sure everything's in good shape, you know, for three to four years while this is all leaching through. But these all these messages are coming two and three and four weeks later, and then it just causes us, you know, and now it's become political uh, because it's, oh, the Biden administration can't uh, can't react. Oh, the governor can't react. And and so uh, once you get it in that arena and into the into the political uh, realm, it, it, I think it, it's scary to people. And that's where I think the disservice is. People need to know that their water and air are safe. And that's the bottom line. You know that if you've been a firefighter, uh, an EMT, that's the big concern that people have. And by the way, they used firefighting, firefighting foam on that to keep it from burning. And, you know, there's a lot of chemicals in that. So I think we just have a more extensive problem than than maybe some of the other derailments that happen. Yeah, and, and I think there's also things get spun out of control by, with terms that people don't understand. For example, the the uh, pollution in, in the water being measured in parts per billion, you right. know, a part, one part per billion is one ten millionth of 1%. So, right. you know, they're very, very tiny amounts. And while nobody wants to have any of this, when, when you're that far under the EPA guidelines for any chemical that is measured in parts per billion, uh, people can t- kind of take a deep breath and, and not, and be less panicky, I think about the toxicity of, of their drinking water. Uh, right. And I think the assurances are and the testing has been testing at those low levels and the EPA always overcorrects. So, you know, if they're not, right. you know, uh, waving the red flag here that, you know, they're assuring people that their waters are safe. But uh, I, I still think there's a lot of questions. I, you know, it's funny, not funny, haha, funny, but ha- living in the Kanawha Valley and having a chemical spill in your water like we did in 20, I believe, 2013, you really understand how this pervades your thinking every single day, whether you drink, bathe your child, wash your clothes, cook, whatever. And uh, and so I, I have a lot of em- empathy for the people living there and understand it. Absolutely. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Senator Capito. Hey, Matt. 
Um, yeah. I, I'd like to shift gears and talk about a p- potential legislation that could have a, an impact on West Virginia that you recently brought up, and that's the National Gas Export Expansion Act. Right. Yes. I think that uh, what's happened uh, in this uh, in this administration, unfortunately, is uh, trying to tie the hands of uh, not only our own uh, uh, energy independence through natural gas, but also our ability to export natural gas by uh, putting the clamps down on uh, being able to export uh, as much as we possibly can to help our NATO allies and others. And so this is just would help us expedite our, our natural gas uh, abilities and our ability to export. And I think it would be good for West Virginia and probably good for the security of the, of the world, actually, because energy security is uh, something that's exceedingly important and we see it challenged among our allies. Is there issues with getting the the oil or the, excuse me the natural gas out of West Virginia and coal still? Oh, there's definite issues getting it out of West Virginia because the, of the uh, pipelines. Uh, we we are unable to complete the Mountain Valley pipeline, uh, which would be a major resource to uh, export our our natural gas out of Marcellus Shale, which is the largest find recent in recent history. It's it's enormous in the northern and north north uh, central part of the state. And this has been a chronic problem. And uh, permitting, that's why we need to have permitting reform. Uh, we need to have permitting reform for all forms of energy, whether it's renewable or whether it's natural gas. And we're working on that now. So we do have an issue uh, nationally, but particularly here on the East Coast. Does this, would this bill address the permitting issues? No, unfortunately, it doesn't address the permitting issues. Uh, the permitting issues are something that I've been working on with uh, Senator Carper and my committee. Uh, they're working at it over on the Energy Committee. Uh, we've got a good group together to try to do something to alleviate the seven, eight, nine, nine-year uh, permitting. Uh, it takes that long to get something permitted. We're not saying to alleviate any environmental overview at all. This is just good sense government where you're doing things like one federal decision and, and all that. But this is not in that bill, permitting. This is a big uh, – permitting is a big issue that you see fell flat at the end of the year. We need to revive it. Senator DeCapito, appreciate your time this morning. A, a, a final thought from you. Well, I just uh, – you know, the sun is shining here in West Virginia, and it's beautiful. So I, I don't want to say spring's on the way, but it would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's kind of been spring all winter around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. That's, yeah. We didn't have much snow. We didn't have much snow. So uh, anyway, I think uh, things are slow in Congress right now, and, and sometimes that's a good thing. We've got a good t- – this will give us a good time to uh, carefully study some of the issues like the spill in East Palestine and other things. So it's always, uh, it's always great to be home, though. Very good. Thank you so much for your time this morning. All righty. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Senator Shelley Moore Capito via telephone. So – Pretty big first 50 minutes there. You get your Mac Warner, you get your Sally Moore Capito in there as well.